Let me start with 10.1, I'll ask Sarah on my right to go with 10.2. If you'd like to read a verse around, that would be wonderful. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go out, I am sending you like sheep among wolves. Take no money or a bag or extra sandals, and do not converse with people you meet. Whenever you enter a home, give it your blessing. If those, okay, keep it. If those who live there are worthy, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing will return to you. Okay, that's for six, for seven. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat what is set before you. And heal those in it who are sick, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But... If you enter a town and the people there do not welcome you, go through their streets, telling them, We are wiping off even the dust from your town, which clings to our feet, to show you our disapproval. But you should recognize this, the kingdom of God has come close to you. Mm -hmm. The truth is, even wicked, Sodom will be better off than such a town on the judgment day. Okay, let's stop there. That's a mouthful. <coughs> gentle Jesus, meek and mild. You see what is a false idea you've been given of Jesus largely? He was very gentle. He was very kind, reflecting his father. But he's extremely tough, is he not? If those people don't accept the apostles here, you're to wipe the dust off your shoes. That's to say, even the dust of their city is an anathema. Get rid of it. Now, we are not apostles. Let make the, let's make this quite clear. There are no apostles like the twelve today. You cannot have them. The reason is you must have seen Jesus literally, and you haven't. You may, indeed, we all think we've seen Jesus spiritually, and, and, and metaphorically we have. I believe we've seen the teaching of Jesus, but we've not seen him literally show up at a church meeting. That stopped, apparently. God made his point. He allowed Jesus to be seen. So you must have seen Jesus to be an apostle at the level of the twelve. You must have. Otherwise you're a false apostle. And there are people around saying they are apostles, even fixing dates for the second coming, and they failed. That's very dangerous, by the way. If you set a date for the second coming, as an acquaintance of ours did recently, and it failed, that's death penalty. Now, it's not being executed now. I see that. But nevertheless, it is a lethal danger to set a date. You don't want to do that. So people like that should not be approved. We should be as kind as we can to them. But that is a very serious mistake to set a date. The Jehovah's Witnesses did that for 1914, of that, and that failed. And then they said, well, we really we got it right, but it was, it was invisible. That's not why, so you don't do that. The other thing about an apostle is, at the level of the Twelve, you have to have the accrediting signs of an apostle. You have to be able to do miracles big time. I cannot. I don't think you can, probably. I don't relate to this very well. Go out and heal the sick. I wish I could do it. I'm quite sure that God answers prayers and he can heal the sick exactly when he wants to. But I don't have that power that Paul had. For instance, they took aprons. These were tent-making aprons from Paul. And they sent them places and that had a healing effect. That is outside my range. I can accept it. The New Covenant scriptures are complete. God can introduce that any time he wishes. But I don't think for the moment we have that apostolic power. So what we do have, though, is a certain amount of understanding, I think, of what Jesus is doing. That I hope we get right. And I do think the spiritual truth we have gives us energy in life. This is not just doctrine in that boring sense. People say, well, doctrine, that boring thing. Give me Christian living. There's no such division in Scripture. All teaching is doctrine. Everything you teach is doctrine, is what it means. And so with the life-giving words of Jesus in our lives, we have energy and health, presumably. So that's what we're working at. We've yeah. been recently looking at this uh, uh, mm -hmm. Shake the Dust of the Field. Yes. Uh, yep. Gil's exposition of the entire Bible, mm -hmm. very grand name, mm -hmm. uh, says uh, that Paul and Barnabas did the same in Antioch, mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. Matthew 10, when the Jews contradicted and blasphemed the gospel <coughs> preached by them. Yeah. In Acts 13, 
this was ordered by Christ to be observed, mm -hmm. should they despise and reject the ministry of his apostles? Yes. Such was their wickedness that even the dust of their country was infected thereby, yeah. as though it defiled them, yeah. so that by this action mm -hmm. they signified that they would have nothing more to do with them or say to them, and that they looked upon them as impure and unholy yes. as any heathen city yes. or country. And mm -hmm. Very strong. My note says, shaking the dust off is an action that symbolized a complete break in fellowship and a renunciation of all further responsibility. So we, we don't, we're not apostles. We cannot make that kind of a threat to people. We should be very generous, very kind, I think. Sorry? I said I hope we don't go around. We do know of somebody actually who's done that to us, so that's a little bit close to the home here, but that's another subject. It does occasionally happen. We don't want that to happen. Mostly people are very forgiving. Well, and very to, to yeah. be fair, there is some, I didn't personally know yeah. the origin or, or you know, you, you've heard it before, right. but I didn't know how grave right. this uh, was. Right. So, right. to be fair, maybe people who use it mm -hmm. Maybe they don't know. No, but I'm sure it's they, instructive to know, I think. I'm sure they don't. They don't mean it quite as strongly as. as, yeah, as I right. hope. Right. Don't forget that you are guilty according to what you can reasonably know. In John <coughs> chapter 15, I won't turn there for the sake of time, but in John 15, Jesus said this to the Pharisees If I had not come and told you this, you wouldn't be guilty. That's very instructive to me. He says it twice in John 15. If I had not, if I, Jesus, himself speaking there, had not come and told you Pharisees what I'm telling you, you would not be guilty. But now that I've told you, watch out. So we have to be careful. When we're hearing teaching that we think, well, you know, we should at least give it a shot. We need to, to examine the Bereans and not say, well, I don't believe that. My mother didn't teach that, so that's a... No, we need to be generous, at least Berean, in our spirit of investigation. You remember in Acts 17, the Bereans were more noble. That's an aristocratic word, by the way. They had a generous noble approach in the best sense, liberal in the best sense. They weren't narrow-minded, they were educated people in some sense, and they searched the scriptures, this is in Acts 17, 11, they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was true, and then Luke says some of them became believers. That's an excellent attitude. So it is part of a good education in the best sense to have an open mind. So we're working at that, we're all trying to learn. Uh, yes. On online questions. Yes. Uh, from, uh, Tony Baldwin? Yes, we know. Wait, yes. Uh, does uh, the shake the dust off your feet, uh, is that comparable to cast not your pearl before swan? It, it is comparable, certainly. Comparable. It is comparable, certainly, yes. Because in that very passage, Jesus had, uh, had just said, don't judge anybody. And be careful with that. You must be discerning, because he goes on the next line to say, don't cast your pearl before swine. Uh-oh, you've just judged that person to be a swine. Don't cast your pearl, right? So, don't judge does not mean don't distinguish between good and evil. It doesn't mean that. That's absolutely false. We have this in counseling sometimes. It's very free and easy. Well, you're great. You know, you're great. Big hug, move on. That doesn't work. People are supposed to repent before they're forgiven. Jesus said it several times. Even Jesus said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. But he didn't say, of course, you, they don't have to repent. We know that. We have to repent of our error. It's difficult to do. And then we can be forgiven. I see that. So that is an interesting point. Obviously, we we'll have to be very careful about saying that somebody's a swine and we don't want to cause pearls before them. It's a dangerous judgment to make, but we're supposed to make that judgment. So discernment is everything. Don't judge doesn't mean don't be discerning, clearly. Don't judge would be, don't be so critically, carpingly critical of everybody, you know. Don't be over, over judgmental in the worst sense. But we are supposed to make decisions about things being right and wrong. Otherwise we're not discerning. Anyway, that's a, that's a great, a great point from Tony Baldwin. Yes, we know who that is. No, Dennis. We know who's Dennis. Oh, Dennis. <laughs> yeah. well, no, I think yeah. Dennis' yeah. son, that is isn't it? No, no. It's not. Uh, yeah, I don't know what he's No, I think he uses that as his oh, name. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting very complicated. It's <laughs> it's people have several names. Okay, whatever. <laughs> we we know who that is. Wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. What else do we want to say about this? Okay, he sent out the 70. <laughs> Some of the versions say 72. Why did they say 72? Well, you'll find in the Old Testament 72 nations, right? So perhaps they're representing 
the 72 nations of the world. He'd sent 12 out, a special in-group, and even with the 12, there were a special three-group, weren't there? James uh, and Peter and Andrew and John four, probably four, they were specially chosen, but the 12 were very special, and now you have 70 or 72, whichever it is, and they were sent out in pairs, that's a good idea, in pairs, to every city and place where he himself was going to come. So, in advance of Jesus getting there, I do remind you, and one of these weeks we'll do our 24 texts that you must have ready to go for your friends. One of them would be Luke 4.43. Let me just throw that one in. Luke 4.43 says, this is utterly brilliant. Americans are so good at purpose statements. You know, they're, you're awfully good. You guys are tremendous. Brits tend to muddle through. Americans are very good. They have their purpose statements. Well, Luke 4.43 is a refrigerated verse, purpose statement. It says, I'll just re remind you, it says, I must preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to the other cities also. That's the reason I was sent, period, right? Isn't that brilliant? That, not many verses come with their own explanation, right, built in, but that does. So Jesus was compelled, like a sheepdog is compelled to round up the sheep. You can't stop it, right? He was compelled to preach the gospel about the kingdom of God to the other cities. That's why God sent me to your gate. Now, if you listen carefully to preaching out here, you're not going to hear that phrase gospel of the kingdom very much. That's rather amazing. You'll hear a lot about Jesus dying and rising, which is excellent. But you don't hear, as you switch on the television, we're going to talk about the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Why? Because Jesus always did. Listen, if you don't talk about the gospel of the kingdom, you don't sound like Jesus. This is the wake up call for all this. You have to sound like Jesus. So that's what he said he was going to do. And this is the, the, the context then for all of this going to send his people out to the cities he was coming to. He was saying then, the harvest is plentiful. Well, you know, the harvest is the end product. The harvest potentially is huge. You sow the seed now. That's the seed message of the gospel of the kingdom, Luke 8, 12. You sow that seed of the message of the kingdom, and then at the end comes a huge harvest. That's what we're trying to do. The harvest is plentiful, potential harvest. The harvest hasn't come because the harvest is the end of the age, that's in Matthew 13. You've got to have a handle on all of this stuff to teach it effectively. The harvest is the end of the age. We aren't there yet. That's when Christ comes back. That's in Matthew 13. The harvest is the end of the age. The laborers apparently are few. What do you make of that? There aren't too many doing it. So <laughs> pray then that God would send more laborers out into the field. And he said then in verse 3, I'm sending you out. As lambs in the midst of wolves. Are you ready for it? Doesn't sound like fun, does it? People are wolves, they're gonna gobble you up. <laughs> they're not gonna like what you say, they're gonna eat you up. So lambs are to be gentle, obviously. We're back to that. Don't be overly uh, judgmental in the wrong sense. Lambs in the midst of wolves. Not, not armed uh, lambs. Not armed. Don't take guns out. No. Uh, that's terribly politically incorrect in America. I understand that, but I'm going to insist on that. Jesus was not in the gun business. He actually wasn't. This is a shocking, shocking truth. See, what this tells me is that you might get slaughtered. You might get killed for it. I mean, are you ready for that? Right. Uh, just a question on the Lord of the Harvest. Yeah. Who's that, God or Jesus? Well, it doesn't matter. matter really. God is the ultimate Lord of the harvest. Jesus is the, is the second. He's not the Lord God. He's the Lord Messiah. They both work together. I and the Father are one. means we're working hand in glove. Only one is the Lord God. That's the Father. The other one is the Lord <coughs> Messiah who got born in Luke 2.11. That's the second one. Two, two major verses. You've got your Luke 4.43. That's the great purpose statement. Luke 4.43. Now I've thrown in the second one of the 24. We'll have to get through sometime. But Luke 2.11 says... Luke 2 11 says, the Lord Messiah was born. Messiah Lord, right? Not God Lord, you see. God doesn't get born. God doesn't die. God doesn't get born. This is very easy stuff. But it became rather muddled. So the Lord Messiah got born in Bethlehem. That's wonderful. Just He's the a, Messiah Lord. Sorry, yeah. I'm on a new question. Yes. They're coming. Okay. They're coming fast. <laughs> okay. uh, this <laughs> phrase of at hand, the mm -hmm. kingdom of God yeah. is near. Some translations yes. at hand. Yes. Uh, as we know, a lot of confusion about that. Is it here now? Yeah. What does that That's mean, right. etc.? What's yeah, it's, it's a great question. It is here in one sense and not in another. So if you get a Bible study going where people say, well, I think the kingdom of God is definitely present. No, I think it's all in the future. They're both right. 
but in different senses. They're both right. The kingdom of God is at hand is exactly what the prophet said in the Old Testament. They kept saying, the day of the Lord is at hand. Watch out, it's coming. It's actually thousands of years ahead of them. It seems to be a way of getting people's attention. There's an urgency, right? Because you might die today, heaven forbid. Mm -hmm. So get ready, because the next event you're going to face is the day of the Lord. You're going to face God in the judgment. So there's always an urgency, as I understand it. So here's what you can say in Bible studies. The kingdom of God is not present in this sense. You can go to Jerusalem, you won't find Jesus sitting on the throne there. You go, blind, have a look. In that sense, the kingdom of God is not here, you get it? You are not ruling the world, I repeat, you are not ruling the world, but you're going to. The kingdom of God is not present in the sense that the saints are not managing the world. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 2. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 says, don't you know the saints are going to manage the world? I don't, as far as I see, you're not managing the world. Hopefully you're managing your own life and you're doing some management, but you're not managing the world. So that's why the kingdom hasn't come. That's the sin of it not being here. However, the spirit of the kingdom must be present. I hope the kingdom of God is right here. I'm looking at the royal family of the kingdom right here. Yes, the kingdom of God is present. The spirit of the kingdom would better be here. The promises of the kingdom, the sexual purity of the kingdom has to be among us. Then there are a lot of fringe things that you don't have to worry about. Right? You want to have a small glass of wine, go for it. You don't, that's fine. Don't fuss about vegetarianism and meat. That's absolutely irrelevant. You know, if you want to keep Sabbath on Wednesday, I don't recommend you do it. <laughs> it's not a problem. First day is a very good day because it's the day of the resurrection. But that's a little thing for some people. So yeah. that, in that sense, the kingdom is present, but not in the other sense. That, that observation of in one's in this sense it's not here yet and right. you point to Jerusalem right. but for people who are taught that you go to heaven right you know that doesn't they, they wouldn't understand would they like no obviously the going to heaven at death uh, it, it, it throws a as we say throws a spanner or a wrench it's in America right it's into the into the works right. of the car right Both it makes things very difficult so <laughs> instead of looking forward to the second coming of Jesus and the kingdom now you're looking at people going to heaven when they die, so why do they need... The whole thing is muddled, right? Most textbooks understand this well, but it isn't well understood in church. So, yes, the solution would be to get rid of the immortal soul idea. Imagine when you're dead, you're actually dead. Or as in Georgia, they say when you're dead, you're actually dead. Is it clear? Okay, so let's not pray to Mary, because Mary isn't alive. That's just a waste of time. Save your candle money. No point in that. The dead are actually dead. The only way out of death is resurrection. Read the New Testament with that. It's exciting. The only way you come out of death is by resurrection. And that will happen at the second coming. Or oh, there's a third verse. We've got three of our 24. Third verse, 1 Corinthians 15.23. 1 Corinthians 15.23 says this. These are refrigerated verses. 1 Corinthians 15.23 says, Those who belong to Christ will be raised at his second coming. That's a beautiful verse. They'll be raised from death. At his, and you know the Greek word for the second coming, the parousia. That means the arrival of the king to take over his territory. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 23. So we've had three major verses here. We've had Luke 2, 11. We've had Luke 4, 43. And we've now got 1 Corinthians 15, 23. These are the framework verses around which this whole thing seems to go here. Okay, so the laborer then is working for the Great Commission, that's the end of Matthew, the Great Commission is go into the entire world and preach the gospel and teach them to observe everything that Jesus taught. That's easy, isn't it? It says you listen to Jesus and then you go and tell everybody. There are systems out there that make that frightfully difficult because there are some systems saying, well, no, 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 the teaching of Jesus was for Jews, that's not for you. That's fundamentally wrong. Jesus said, take everything I've taught, teach it to the whole world, so I remind you of this amazing quotation from Dr. James Kennedy. Many people today think that the essence of Christianity is Jesus' teaching, but that's not so. Excuse me, Dr. Kennedy, that is fundamentally false. You're misleading the people. I repeat, many people today think the essence of Christianity is Jesus' teaching, but that is not so. What? You've just destroyed the New Testament. Christianity, he says, centers not in the teachings of Jesus, but in the person of Jesus as incarnate God who came to die for your sins. Well, he's not incarnate God because God cannot die. That's very tricky. And yes, the teaching of Jesus is everything. We could give six verses on that. Let's, let's not clutter your notes with too many verses. But if you lose that, I think you've, lose, you've lost the whole point of what Jesus is doing. So the teachings of Jesus are very important. 
Okay, so back to the text here then. Carry no money and so on, right? That's interesting, isn't it? Now, he didn't make that an order, I think, for all of us throughout all time. Though I have to remind you, there are people who are wealthy in the New Testament. As long as they're generous, that's fine. There's a text in Mark which says, if you believe in the gospel, you get lands and people and friends and brothers right now. So it's not wrong to have wealth, provided one is generous with it. But on this occasion, then they're to rely on the friendship, what, a good family that they find in town. Don't go door by door, by the way. That's interesting. Don't go door to door. Find a place of lodging where good people are there. They'll welcome you as gospel preachers. And then you operate from there. I suppose you could go door to door. You probably go in the marketplace. So what is the marketplace today? The internet. The internet. Obviously. Paul went to the marketplace. And just with I've been picked, hey, let me talk to you about Jesus, right? Let me tell you about this. The marketplace is right here. I think this is the, the, the center for ideas across the world. Right? Absolute miracles. I can't get over this thing. This is incredible. So you can do whatever you can in the marketplace. And then he does say the labor is worthy of his wages. So you don't keep moving from house to house. You, get, you rely on this one family to look after you. I see it. And you can take wages for preaching or not. Paul didn't sometimes. He made tents in the evening deliberately so as not to burden the people with a financial. But if people want to pay somebody to do it, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine. It's a, it's a matter of choice. But in principle, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Don't keep moving from house to house. And then if they receive you, if they welcome you, then you eat the food that's given you. And you heal those. I wish we could do it. I, would, I, I really wish we had a better handle on this. I, do, I don't know that we're doing our best here. We may not be. I mean, I'll just throw in this. For what it's worth, a lot of people take the orthodox medical system as God's final word. It may not always be. Have you thought of religion being confused? Possibly, then we need to look for alternative. I don't know. This is not my field of expertise, but there are other branches of medicine that might help. Diet and things like that. That's, that's a wider subject than I'm able to compete with. So, if God will heal you directly of your disease, that's wonderful too. I don't see it happening quite in the way that Jesus talks of it here. But at least the kingdom of God has come near. Yes, the power of that kingdom has been displayed in your presence. It should be here. I, I, I really think the kingdom of God is right here. However, I don't think you're ruling the world yet. Jesus is not sitting on the throne of David. When it does happen, you're going to see the nations beat their swords into plowshares. Is it clear? You will not be able to take up a gun and shoot somebody. Jesus is going to say, stop it. He's not doing it now, is he? So when the kingdom of God comes, Jesus will be sitting on the throne of David. This is classical premillennialism. Uh, I think that's wonderful. So we're praying then, thy kingdom come. And as you look out on the tragic <coughs> scene out there, isn't that, doesn't that break your heart? I guess I shouldn't. Show this, maybe that will. Man's inhumanity to man. Can you show it? These are pictures of children and people who were tortured by napalm bombing in the last war. I don't really want to even show them. The man's inhumanity to man is a shocking thing. Where is it? Anyway, that's, a, that's enough. The back. That's a yellow, greenish jelly that you can make out of petroleum, and you throw that around. That's going to stop. That's thy kingdom come. That's good news, isn't it? Can you imagine being able to say, put that gun away, you idiot. Don't ever imagine shooting something. Yes, you might have to die. So that's a tough doctrine, I think. Very hard. But Jesus did say, love your enemies. If you're convinced you can shoot your enemy, love it. Okay, go for it. But I'd be very sure that you're convinced of that. I'd be very careful with that one. So it's a very tough Sorry, can you hold that up one more? I didn't have the... Okay. Well, I, didn't, I don't want to make too much of this, but this is... Man's I, I had an image on this. Inhumanity screen. to man. Yep. People Thank you. injured by napalm bombing. There's a famous Roman Catholic preacher who realized that when he was blessing the bomber, the, the man flying the plane, doing a blessing on him, that Roman Catholic <coughs> pilot went out and bombed the nuns. That made him think. 
He said, he didn't speak up. He's ashamed of himself. So Christians killing each other in war is a difficult concept. Right? So I found, I found that challenging when I first read that. Anyway, it's not our, our main point here. Heal those that are in it, say the kingdom of God, the presence of the, the power of the kingdom has come to you right now. I see that. But the kingdom, properly speaking, is going to be when Christ comes back and all the nations are going to beat their swords into plowshares. Two things. And if they receive you, fine. If they don't, then you shake the dust off your feet. Then in 12, Jesus said, I'm telling you this now, it will be more tolerable in that future day, in the day of judgment, that is, for Sodom than for that city. Well, how, to how tolerable was it for Sodom and Gomorrah? You're totally wiped out. That's tough language. I, I recommend you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke a lot, by the way. People love Paul's letters, and they're wonderful. They love the book of John, which is wonderful. But people tend to shy away from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Three corroborating accounts of the teaching of Jesus. I found it preparing for this, you know, wow. This is, this is heavy stuff. You know, that's the Old Testament God, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, people want to say that the Old Testament God is, yeah. especially atheists or agnostic, yeah. is one God. And, oh, and this New Testament God is another. No, it's the same God. It's the same and, God. And these declarations by Jesus is a sort of throwback to the yep. stone and fire. We're uh, very selective in our verses. We don't put on the refrigerator the verse which says, Jesus said, when I come back, he said, bring my enemies in front of me and do what? Execute them. You hear that? That's Jesus. Those who do not want me to rule over them, execute them in my presence. There was a lady theologian who said, oh, Jesus couldn't have said that. That's not my Jesus. <laughs> well, it happens to be the words of Jesus. But it didn't fit her image of Jesus. So there's a violent streak there. And this is tough, isn't it? It's going to be better off for Sodom and Gomorrah in the judgment, than for those people who refuse the apostles and their teaching. That is, that's tough stuff. Okay, let's go on to 13. Now Jesus gets to some of his woes. This is a tough period. Yes, question? Yes, oh, yeah. Please. In uh, verse 4, mm -hmm. he's giving them instructions. Yes. What is, do we have any clue what the purpose of them to not wear shoes is? And to oh, not, I see. not even greet anybody. That's a great question. Not even say hello to anybody. That I seems have a, a little note on the, on the greeting. It yes. says, the urgency of the mission did not allow for the usual elaborate greetings. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Just well, no it was, their custom oh, was, yeah. you don't just say hi and keep going. Right, it was a right. long, invite <laughs> somebody over. <laughs> long yeah. drawn up yeah. thing, yeah. But I imagine no shoes would be no extra shoes. No I'm extra guessing, shoes, yeah. I think no extra yeah. shoes. And don't get delayed. In other words, the, the task is so urgent. Get on with it, find a place to stay, and get out there and preach. I, th I think so. It's a good point, though. Great question, yeah. Lambs amidst wolves. Okay, let's go to 13, then. There's only 13. You. Me? Okay. Woe to you, Karazim. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in judgment than for you. In you, Capernaum, you will not be exalted to heaven. You will go down to Hades. Right. Anyone who hears you speak, hears me. And anyone who rejects you, rejects me. But anyone who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Okay, let's start there. There is a triangle there. God, Jesus, and the apostles. You see that? There is a trio. God speaks through Jesus, his agent, and the apostles here are speaking as agents of Jesus. It's a definite triangle, isn't it? It doesn't matter if you're hearing the apostles, it's the same as hearing Jesus, it's the same as hearing God who commissioned. This is the principle of agency. Agency. The Jews say nicely that a sponsor is like his agent's personality. So here's what we do in the classroom. We say, okay, then let's suppose Vicky sends me out on a job. Okay, I'm Vicky. I'm not Vicky, but I'm Vicky. Can you handle that? Because that, 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 it's the most key principle here. 
I'm not Vicky. Okay, Sandy sends me on a job. Okay, you deal with me. I'm Sandy. I'm not almost Sandy, but I'm Sandy. If you can handle that little puzzle, you've got the idea. So one speaks with the other. So I, I get that. Now he then he takes these other wicked cities. And Capernaum is where, of course, he lived. So they should have known. They had Jesus right there. It will not be exalted to heaven. It will be brought down to the grave. That's just, we're not talking about going to heaven when you die. But heaven is just there. The metaphor is highest possible exaltation, promotion. And Hades is the grave. That's where all the dead are, the good and the bad, the place of the sleep of the dead. Gravedom, you might call it. Gravedom. That's the lowest point you can get to. So it seems then that listening to Jesus would be important. Is that right? It wasn't a voice from heaven that said what? This is my beloved son. For goodness sake, Shema listens to him. So the people who say the teachings of Jesus are not important are fundamentally wrong. We have to be quite clear on that. No mincing of words. If you say that the teachings of Jesus are for Jews only, you've wiped out the whole deal. That's my son. Listen to him. Wow. Okay. I don't know what else to say. What, what, what's your reaction here? What, what is this? It's just tough stuff. Yeah. My, my version uses the word accept in the first part of 16. Uh -huh. Anyone who accepts your message yes. also accepts me. Yes. And so we know what it means to accept Jesus. Absolutely. I, I mean, this is wonderfully definitive. This is an amazing. Mm -hmm. Anyone who accepts my message mm -hmm. accepts me. Mm -hmm. So can you accept Jesus without the message? You cannot. Yes. And if you were the devil, the trick would be to say, won't you accept Jesus? Please accept Jesus. Jesus died for you. That's all good. But if you don't tell them the message, you're deceiving them. That's why it's important to get back to the Matthew, Mark, Luke teachings of Jesus. So, well, four verses. We've got three of our 24 verses. Let's add a fourth one. We've got three of them. We mentioned Luke 4.43. We mentioned um, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.23. And we mentioned one other. What was Luke 4.11. Luke 4.11. Luke 2.11. Oh, sorry. Luke 2.11. Yes, of course. The Lord was signed up. All right. One other. Jesus didn't mention anything about his death until Matthew 16, verse 21, is it? Think of that. Only when you get to Matthew 16, it's two-thirds of the way through the ministry, did he even mention his death and resurrection. Here's a conversation supper for your friends. Okay, what was Jesus talking about before he mentioned his death and resurrection? See? The answer is the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Then he began to say, this is Matthew 16, 21. We've got four key verses this morning. Matthew 16, 21. He says, now let me tell you something. I'm going to have to die for the sins of the world and be raised from the dead. And they didn't even believe it. And yet he'd been preaching the gospel. This is a conversation stopper. Try this with the local newspaper. Try this on Fox News. I wish I could get Megan to, to deal with this question. I'd love to talk to Megan Kelly about this. Have you thought of this now, Megan? How is it that Jesus didn't mention his death and resurrection until Matthew 16, 21? Then he began for the first time. They didn't even believe it. And yet he'd been preaching the gospel. That will change people's lives when they think about it. There's four key verses. All right, so what else have we got then? The one who sent me, the one who commissioned me, is God the Father. You reject God by rejecting Jesus, and in this case, you reject them both by rejecting the apostles. Now, then it gets a little easier. We're, we're Can through this. Tyre and Sidon? Can yeah. you give us like a one sentence? Of what, what Tyre and Sidon are, are pagan areas, are they not? Tyre and Sidon uh, are uh, not, not Jewish areas, and so they would be regarded as worse than unclean. Mm. There was a dear lady who had a demon-influenced child, and remembering that Jesus, as he said, was only sent to the lost sheep in the house of Israel at that stage, at that stage. And this dear, dear lady from Tyre came, it's in, in Matthew 15, I think, and said, Messiah, help me. i got this child. This child would have fits. The child would throw himself, herself into the fire and foam at the mouth. And I asked the disciples to deal with them, they couldn't manage it. And he said, this is the argument that Jesus didn't win. I like this. He didn't win this argument. And this dear lady from Tyre, a pagan, said, please help me. I know you can. 
And finally he turned to her, and you can see, the, you can hear the emotion in his voice there. Oh, lady, your faith is enormous. Your faith is terrific. Well done. And he healed the child. Isn't that marvelous? That's wonderful. That was a pagan from Tyre. She wasn't even a Jew. She wasn't an Israelite. So, yeah. So it's going to be, it's going to be very tough, though, for those pagans who didn't repent. It's a threatening message here. All right, 17. Now it gets a little bit a little more joyful. Who's going to do 17? Yes. Me? Yes. Right, I saw Satan falling from heaven as a flash of lightning. And I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Sorry, uh, verse 7. All right, well, it's fine. 19, she did. We'll just fill in with 17. The 70 came back with joy, saying, Lord, even the demonia, the demons, 17 is the demons, are subject to us in your name. Sorry. The only mistake you're allowed the whole year, right? That's fine. We, we get it twice this way. It's even better. 17, the 70 returned with joy. Can you imagine excitement? Wow, you ain't seen nothing here. You can't imagine what happened. We're laying hands on these people and children who are autistic, children, whatever that may be the cause of that. I, I'm not saying that autism is, is, is not, but whatever that is, uh, they're healed. In your name, though, demons exist, right? Here's a fifth verse, Luke 441 in your notes. A fifth verse says the demons spoke to Jesus. Luke 441, Luke 441. Luke 4.41 says the demons spoke to Jesus and Jesus spoke to the demons. They exist. I hate to tell you, they do exist. They're not human beings and they're not they're mentally ill human beings. Much less are they diseases. Diseases don't speak. The demons are a supernatural realm of fallen angels, presumably, and they're opposed to God and Jesus. So they are subject then to us apostles here in your name. That's to say, as we preach your truth, right? The power of the apostolic preaching subdued the demons, and it can still do that too. There was in Africa uh, a man sitting right here. We were in a very dark church, just little candles, and suddenly we're talking about Jesus being the Messiah, and somebody right here was a woman actually, right here went, I thought, oh, that's a demonic thing, and they kind of bundled her out. She wasn't the problem. The other occasion was where we saw, oh, there was two other occasions. One other was a Bible study where suddenly a man who was a visitor got, went into a rage right in the middle of the night. Just got up and just went mad. We all had to subdue him. Eventually, he came to America, became son, and got a job. That was Jorge George. He did real well. The other one was where a man knew our names, apparently, for he knew. He simply knew who we were. That, that was very spooky. Anyway, demons are more obvious there, but I, I suspect they may be very active in the West as well, perhaps in the South West. Okay, the demons are subject then, and Jesus says, yes, and probably the meaning is, I was watching Satan fall from heaven. Perhaps the meaning is, I saw Satan rushing to, to save his kingdom. It may be that. It's not, it's not talking about a, a pre-mundane fall of Satan. Jesus was seeing, as the demons were subject to the teaching of the apostles, Satan is trying to rescue his a threat, probably threatened kingdom and uh, behold I've given you authority to tread on serpents these are demonic forces and scorpions, they're likened to animals just as Herod was likened to a fox doesn't mean that Herod was a fox but he's like a fox, the demons are like scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing is going to injure you I'd feel pretty good if I was in the, in the group so we're given this, this level of protection then from God. A uh, uh, question from Bob yeah. Warren. Um, is Jesus talking about himself in verse 18? I saw Satan. Yes. Oh, absolutely. When, when did I, this happen? Right then. Some sort of a vision. Right? He's seeing. I was watching. My translation does it well. I was watching. Right there, nothing to do with the pre-existing life. Now, I, it's not, it's, not, it's not the fall of Satan, the fall of Genesis. I was watching, it's in, in connection with this event. I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Yeah, absolutely. I, Jesus, no question. That's I, Jesus, so, was watching. I saw what was going on. So the implication is that the power of Satan was being broken. It's a metaphor for... Absolutely. That's what my note says. The power of Satan was broken and the success of the 70 over demons was proof of it. 
That's what phone and like like it. Great. So it's metaphorically is watching yeah. the right. 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 It's like watching him being chopped down. Yes. Mm -hmm. Person by person or demon by demon okay. or whatever. Right. I mean, in our previous belief, this was a proof that Jesus yeah. pre-existed in the Old Testament. Yeah, no, I, I he watched, right. say, which doesn't, that doesn't fit in the context of what this is Not so yeah. Well, that's a pretty good modern day example when you you can tell someone out that it's like, uh, I see you fall or something. Mm -hmm. or you're, you know, your business will fall. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, in other words, as, as the 70 have, had, have gone out and have had success, yeah. mm -hmm over the demons, demonic world, it's it's chopping down Satan's power. Absolutely. He's saying, you yeah. know, yeah. He, he was probably excited about that. Oh, true. Right. To, to, well, this, yeah. yes. this is not yes. just these people learning the gospel, That's right. but the, the whole the yes. Satan yes. world thing, you know, yes. the world thing is being taken down yeah. 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 As, as if he's falling from heaven. Marvelous, okay. absolutely. I think it's the sense, right. and that's the MacArthur Study Bible you have. No, it's the Ryrie. Ryrie, 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 Ryrie Study Bible. Ryrie. A lot of good notes in these oh, study Bibles. Oh, yeah. Good. I thought they'd take advantage. Yeah, there's an occasion where two blind men, I mean, can you imagine the excitement? They're blind, you know, they've never seen. Oh, we want to see. What can I do for you? We're going to see. I would love to see Jesus. And do you know how they addressed him? Lord, Son of David. That's not Lord God. Lord, Son of David. That's the purest messianic title you can get. They knew who he was. So it's important to know who Jesus is. And they plead with him, Lord, Son of David, please help us. We'd like to see. Lays hands on them and they're seeing. Can you imagine the excitement? That is thrilling, isn't it? Very exciting. Okay, so he rejoices then, especially in verse 21. Who's going to read 21? Oh, before that, we well, haven't finished yet. Okay, 20. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this. In other words, don't rejoice mainly in this or only in this <coughs> doesn't mean don't rejoice at all don't be just so thrilled about only this fact but be sure that the, uh, the fact that spirits, demons demonia, spirits, same thing subject to you but do rejoice mainly that your names are recorded in heaven that's in the book of life which is a record of all the citizens of the kingdom you find that in Isaiah chapter 4 the citizen list of the kingdom of God. Your names are inscribed there. Now, of course, we know that if we don't hang in there, we can have them erased. That's an awful text. I don't want you to go there. The Revelation says, if you don't repent, he says to the churches, I'm going to wipe your name out. Oh, that's an awful text. So it's not once saved, always saved. You've got to persist to the end. Um, it's not quite that easy. But the great thing then, your name is recorded in heaven's book of life, if you like. Okay, 21. Who's got that one? Well, tons of Can you go back to 19 yeah. and just yeah. make sure you address this? Yeah. Um, because there's entire denominations that take this yeah. serpent business. Okay. He you know, <laughs> gave them the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Oh, yeah. The power of the enemy and nothing will injure them. Mm. So this was special power given to these oh, guys yes, yes. at that time. Yeah. It doesn't mean we can bring serpents in here. I know, you can try. I'm many <laughs> What you're talking about. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. We saw a movie. It's fascinating you should say that. No, well, actually, there are churches yes. oh, no. that online, Absolutely. especially in the deep I mean, south, I mean, they I mean, have in some of the most venomous names. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I, I think they're kind of a little smart because they, they, they know how to hold the snake so it doesn't bite them. I mean, <laughs> the proof of the pudding would be to let the snake bite you. <laughs> And be healed, but they're just—it's just. Unfortunately, they died. We saw a movie on that that's very a, thing. That's a yes. test of their faith, yes. and their power. We saw we saw a complete movie on, on exactly what you're describing there. Yeah. And my reaction is exactly what you said. These people are mad. They really ought to be locked up because that is absolutely criminal. You know, the law is against the abuse of children, and right. That is abuse. I think it is terrible, criminal, isn't it? It should These be. These people are under the. It should be. under the. Undercover. Well, I think a person's going yeah. to hold a snake if they do that. I don't, yes. Yes. They they don't think they can danger their children. They are, the, with the pastors or whatever you yeah. want to call yeah. them, are up front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're having yeah. these snakes. Yes. You have children in the audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they're parading these snakes right. around. Yeah. They're using venomous snakes. Yes. Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're not venomous. Maybe 
you know, they're trying to trick the people because I would be. But there have been cases where people have died. Those people have gone on and followed this teaching yeah. Yeah. that this. And like they've been bit three or four times and finally, mm -hmm. finally they died. They yeah. died because okay. the system. Sorry, so it is illegal in some states Kentucky, okay. uh, Virginia. So it is illegal. Yeah. In Georgia, maybe you can get away with it. <laughs> Probably. Let's do it. The worst thing is that when many of us here, when the pastor dies, the people carry on. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's exactly. in heaven. Yeah. Okay. God took him. Yeah. God wanted him. Yes. Yeah. God him. took him home. Yes. Yeah, the scorpions obviously are a metaphor for the devil. The demons here. Clearly. You don't take that literally. And actually, it's funny thing is, I never worried about uh, Vicky when she came first to church. Oh, yeah. You know, we didn't go to her car and see what. Have you got a snake in there you want one? It didn't occur to us. <laughs> At all. Sorry, Anthony, did you say this whole thing is, is uh, metaphor? The well, snakes and the scorpions? Of course. It's metaphorical, of course. This it's is over all the power of the enemy. Yes. Not literally serpents, any more than that fox Herod. Jesus said, that fox Herod. Yes, okay, well, he must have been a fox. No, that's a. Come on, let's use our wits here. We know that trees don't clap their hands. That's a metaphor. You know? No, I took it. I took, I it, took it literally. I've taken it literally all along. No, but you're right. This that God's going to give them special protection if they happen to. Right. They're in bare feet for crying sure. out loud. Yeah. <laughs> well, then you see the too. story of Moan and Nags where he did get bitten, and I guess that's in my head. Yeah. But yeah. this yeah. note does it's say. supernaturally that. protected from natural. Right. The part, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Happen. You can take it literally as well. It would still work. You get protection, hopefully, from war. But, but most of the Bible notes yeah. I'm seeing are, it says they're examples yeah. of the hostility. Of course. Uh, it they're demonic. used as a battle image. Of course. Particularly since he is talking about the right. demonic yeah. activity. Uh, it makes sense. Used to me. Yeah. Okay. Right. Nevertheless, <laughs> don't rejoice. Rejoice that the name is. Okay. Anyway, there's a great deal of excitement here. So <coughs> Messiah moves from this very tough approach. You, know, you refuse the teachings of Jesus, you're in trouble. Who was reading 21? Or did we do it? Is it Michelle, please? Yeah. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intellectual and intelligent mm -hmm. and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Okay. 22. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. There's that triangle again, isn't it? Father, Son, and Church, right? There's a trio there. So there's sort of a mutual understanding through the Spirit. Okay, so 21. At that very time, in view of this suppression of the demonic world, Jesus rejoiced greatly. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? He was thrilled to pieces with that. Just see the excitement. As I think you would share that, certainly if you've seen that happening. In Pnevmati Ayon, in Holy Spirit, the capital H, capital S is uh, translator's thing, Holy Spirit is the operational presence and power of God or Jesus, indistinguishably. Not a third person, I think. The Holy Spirit never sends any greetings. Greetings are always from the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is never worshipped in Scripture. That's interesting. Jesus himself calls himself the Comforter, so he, he's saying, I'm going away, I'm not going to leave these orphans. I'm coming to you in spirit, is probably the idea there. So it, it's striking that even in 325 AD, the church fathers said, we don't know what the Spirit is. We'll just say we believe in the Spirit. That's fine. Even at 385, they said, well, we're divided. We're not quite clear. We don't need to be de defining that. But for me, the phrase I learned from Bible dictionary long ago is that the Spirit of God is the operational presence and power of God in different ways. I love that. Because we are like God. We are made in the image of God. So your Spirit comes to me when you speak. You get a certain spirit. We say this is a timid spirit, this is a positive spirit, a negative spirit. We do that. It's your ambiance, your atmosphere that you project. Well, the spirit of God is that, not a third person. I don't, mean, don't need that. Although the Seventh Day Adventists had a big meeting and they said we believe in the third person, but they said that third person. They said this. 
That third person is a shy member of the trio. He doesn't do much. Nothing else necessary. No, the operations is right in the Bible dictionary. Most of what we're saying here is in all the big dictionaries. It isn't necessarily in church very clearly, but it's right there. The operational presence and power. Obviously, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. These are qualities of the Spirit. In this case, then, Jesus is rejoicing with God creating this, ex this excitement. I see that. He's thrilled to pieces, as you would be. Just a, a yeah. point on this. Uh, mm -hmm. Jesus, I praise you, Father, yes. Lord of... One of the rare cases where he knows Lord yes. is applied to the Father here, and it's by Jesus. Mm -hmm. there, there's your Psalm 110, one right? yep. two lords. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, Lord is sometimes, kiddos without the article refers to God, generally with the article the Lord, is generally the Lord Jesus, not invariably. In the Old Testament, of course, Yahweh is the Lord. That's the Lord God, 7,000 times. But here, the Lord of heaven and earth is certainly the Father, that's God, the Father, and you've hidden these things. Now that's, that's a mysterious thing. There's a sense in which God can veil people's eyes. I do know for sure in Second Thessalonians, he says, if you don't accept the truth, then I will give you over to a spirit of blindness. You won't be able to understand it. So God is simply saying, as he did with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who, did, who refused to believe what the angel said. Remember that? What happened to him? They couldn't speak for nine months. There's a judgment. Somebody comes to Jesus and says, I hadn't come and told you you wouldn't be guilty, but once we get to speaking, the truth of Scripture, if we do, then a certain responsibility hangs over those who hear, for all of us, I see that. So, it's a matter of then of getting at the truth and accepting it, not refusing it. And if you don't accept it, then God can say, all right, shh, blindness, right? Now I'll show you what it's like to be blind. I'm thinking of certain individuals that we have known who began by saying, well, we must keep the Sabbath on Saturday, we must under the new covenant. I don't think that's right. Now they're beginning to doubt the virgin birth, I see, many years later. That's a sign of falling apart, frankly. And others who insisted on wearing tassels, they wanted all the women and the men to wear tassels, and that particular family gave up the faith entirely. So watch out. You can unravel at the edge. You don't want to give up believing in the virgin birth. They say, I don't believe it. No, you have to believe it. You don't want to be struck down, maybe. There is a justice that seems to work, even now. Okay, so this is exciting. He's thrilled. And then he talks about this mutual understanding between Father, Son, and those to whom God reveals the truth. And you're to be like a little child. Isn't that wonderful? There's a text which says, unless you accept the kingdom of God gospel as a little child, you won't enter it. What? You're not going to get it. You're not going to make it unless you'll accept the gospel of the kingdom like a child. You know, tell a child something, you're going to believe it, don't you? Tell them that the moon is made out of cheese, they believe it. That's wonderful. I love that. The Bible is for ordinary folk. It's not for scholars to pass over Greek words. Believe me, if what we do in church is not readily acceptable and, and accessible, it's wrong. The trouble is it's become a, a denominational fight, right? 38,000 different denominations all disagree. That doesn't look good to me. So what we're trying to do, restoration is what they try to do. So let's get back to the essential, like, my God, stop that. Okay, Jesus, I get it. The gospel's about the kingdom. Sexual purity, very important. You want to have pork or not pork, don't worry about it. You want to have a glass of wine, that's fine. These are not things to pass about. You want to celebrate your birthday or wedding anniversary? Let's not divide on that. That creates confusion. So I, as I see it, simplicity is of the essence of it. Otherwise, what good is the Bible? It's, it's a useless book and it's so complicated. Okay, like a child, I love that. And I well, to piggyback on what yes. you said about, I think the reference to the child is that when you view a child, a child is very innocent. Absolutely. And it, it doesn't have kind of preconceived notions in my days. As adults, our minds are contaminated yes. with, with you know what we've Absolutely. heard and seen in terms. Of, so, and then if, if, if you even want to take it literally, when you get a newborn baby or even a little two-year-old. Um, in the world, we have the issues of color, racism, and yes. different things. And if you take a little child yes. and play with another child equally <laughs> and love it, don't see color, don't see anything. So, I, you know, I think that's, that's a great point. very, you know, on that scale. Simplicity, yes. Yeah. Do you worry about the child being politically correct or exactly. theologically correct? No, I don't think you do. That's a great, that's a great image, yes. I love that. Okay, so uh, all things, yeah, we, that's an amazing verse. 
the trio of God, Jesus, and the believers. Now, 23, whose turn is it to read? Can, can I just mention yeah, that? Verse 22 makes it absolutely impossible for Jesus to be God yeah. because God gave him authority. Yes. And God can be right. given authority. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't need that complication. It's so complicated. It's all, he's 100% God, 100% man. That's half and half. Very difficult. And so you, they don't preach on all that in the church because it's mind boggling. They don't need to, honestly. God is God, and the Son is the Son. Makes it easier, although we didn't understand that for a long time. Okay, then turning to the disciples, 23, who's going to read that for us? Me. Mm -hmm. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. Mm -hmm. I tell you, many prophets and kings have, have wanted to see mm -hmm. what you are seeing, but they did not see them mm -hmm. and wanted to hear the things you are hearing, but did not hear them. Okay, stop right there. Now, they did, the prophets, of course, did understand a great deal. But they didn't see the Messiah actually operating. They did understand a lot. But his point must be here, they would love to have seen the Messiah himself on the scene, healing, preaching the gospel. It's not to say that the prophets understood nothing, because we know they did. The prophets of Israel understood a lot. But there's an element here that they didn't see, but you're seeing it. Seeing, of course, is not just seeing physically, it's seeing with the mind as well. And hearing means understanding, of course the things that you're hearing and seeing. I hope this applies to us. I can't feel, as I get older, you know, I, I feel, whoa, this is, this is amazing. But I'm a, I'm a Church of England boy, where we didn't know nothing about nothing. And I'm not, I'm not cursing the clergy. Maybe I wasn't listening. <laughs> but they, they, they didn't do this stuff very well, or they didn't say it clearly. So our life, I mean, our career has been the Bible. People say, well, what are you doing in the States? Is your brother living in the States? What? No, no, I'm from Britain. I'm from England. I'm a green card guy. I'm not even a citizen. Why aren't you a citizen? Well, I can't be bothered to fill out the forms. I drive on the same wrong side of the road as you guys do. Wrong side of the road, right? And I pay the same taxes exactly, and we should pay our taxes exactly right. Why would I bother? I don't need to. I'm, I'm rejoicing in the amazing country that this is, where you can have food, any sort of food, within 10 minutes of where you are. And you go into Olive Garden and you say, this is not the Great Tribulation for us. It is, this is not the great tribulation. We've been given a lot of stuff. We've been given the money to do what we do. We have. God's been very good to us. That's the way it's worked for us, at least. Okay, so the children are recommended here. And then, 25, a lawyer. A lawyer would be a professional theologian, that sort of person. A scribe. And put him to the test. Okay, who's going to be 25? Maybe Michelle. Yes. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law, in the Torah? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, You are right. Do this, and you will live. And then he goes on to the Good Samaritan. Let's leave that for a because we've got a short time. We're going to do a communion with Carlos and little time to do it. Okay, this is a wonderful question. Putting him to the test, I want you to put, put in your margin of Mark 12. We have the same story. Mark 12, verse 28. One of the scribes came. I'm reading from Mark 12, 28. It's the parallel. You've got three versions of this. One of the scribes heard them arguing. Jesus argued, please note. He argued in a decent way, but they love to dispute and talk about Scripture. He heard them arguing, and recognizing that Jesus had answered them well, he asked him a question. What commandment is the foremost of all? This is the power, right? What do I have to do to have eternal life? It's the same idea. Now, eternal life, I will correct your translations here, it's the life of the age to come. Everybody knows that, but it isn't in all the Bibles. It's the life of the age to come. Bishop Wright has it in his translation, I've got it in mine. What shall I do to go to heaven and play a harp on a pink cloud? I don't think so. What shall I do to have the life of the future age? That's the question, isn't it? Which we're all asking. And uh, so Jesus immediately turns to the Bible, doesn't he? Haven't you read the Torah? It tells you what's going on here. Well, where's this thing about the one God? As it's fully explained in Mark 12. Jesus said, 
Here's the most important. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, Shema. Don't miss that one. Well, guess what? We seem to have missed that one. I won't bore you with all the, all the quotes, but the church fathers, who were Greek philosophically minded people, they said, we don't believe in the Jewish error about God. They wrote it. Now, we don't believe in the polytheism of all the pagan nations. We've got somewhere between the two, we've got the Trinity. Do you hear that? It's quite significant. The church fathers actually rejected Jesus' unitary monotheistic creed. This is the huge talking point that hasn't started yet, right? There are thousands of Jews, millions of Jews, who will not come near Christianity in this Trinitarian form. There are billions of Muslims who will not come there to be taught. You know, Allah is one, 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 one. Jews, one, one, will die for that. And strangely enough, though, in churches, we've taken on the Church Father's view of the triune God worked out over a long period of time. Very complicated. So what if this is the start of a really big reformation? You know? we could, it could happen. It could happen. And you know, Sandy goes out there and tells a few friends, and they tell a few friends. Who knows? Something could happen. I don't know. To me, that's the essence of mystery. God is what I love that. You, Father, he raised his hand in John 17, 3 and said, You, Father, are omonos, arithinos, theos. You hear monos and theos there? Monotheism. You are the only one who is true God. Let's argue about that. Let's not. It's very easy. That's wonderful. And Augustine came along and said, No. It should be, you, Father, and Jesus Christ, come on, are the only true God. He did. He forged the text. You can look it up. How many is on John? Look it up online. What? You don't want to mess with scripture like that. Forgery is a crime. Augustine did that. He didn't like that Unitarian thing. So this is the talking point, or should be. It's, it's quite fascinating. Okay, so the scribe Eunice answered correctly. In fact, he reflected exactly what Jesus had said. Jesus gave the Shema, and the scribe said, Yes, you're absolutely right. Hallelujah. God is one. There's no other one beside him. He reflected exactly what Jesus said. And then Jesus said, You got it right. You're done good, is my Georgian, right? You're done good. You're not far from the kingdom. You're on, right, on track for the kingdom. And you're going to have the life of the age to come. Eternal life is a foggy translation. Everybody knows that, except it isn't in the Bible. Okay, so that's that yes. part. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, well, my comment is that is when he asked him, you know, how, what does the Torah say, mm. he quoted Deuteronomy 6 yeah. 5, yes. which is the verse right after the Shema. Yes. Which, but is that that whole thing considered part of the Shema? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Well, Shema is both of those. Right, verses. it is. Okay. And also. Because it's, um, it, you know, right after, you know, you should love it, in Deuteronomy 6 5. Yeah. Deuteronomy 6.6 says, These words which I'm commanding you shall be on your heart. So I assume you didn't just memorize the Lord as one Lord, but you've memorized that, Absolutely. Word, that whole the thing, whole and thing. that's why he was able to answer it just like that. And they died for it. Okay. Children at okay. two years old, the Jewish children, put their hand over their eyes and recite, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And the story is that Rabbi Akiva, who died for the faith, he died with the word Echad on his lips. Echad. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's the time when you recite the Shema, and they were mur murdering him. This is, this is not just a boring doctrine you put on the fridge, you wouldn't this is life. You're not to depart from the one God, because God is a jealous God. I don't know if this, you, you're putting up with this <laughs> very nicely here, but this is not, it's not new to you, I would say. It's a shocking thing. Yeah. So, um, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. The question that the lawyer asked yes. Jesus, um, how they phrase it was um, how do yes. what, what is the the foremost command yeah. mm -hmm. how make? does this question also is this different from the question that Nicodemus asked Jesus in terms of being born again yeah. and referencing to how do you um I, you know, I think yeah, uh, yeah, this uh, question is what shall I do to inherit eternal yeah, life? Right. It's not which Absolutely. commandment is the greatest. Same thing, really no, no, closer no, no. to it. How should a man be born, born again? again? So I, yeah. how Absolutely. do those two parallel? That's They're this. very much close. I mean, yeah, because yes. the eternal life, born again, relates to the life of the age mm -hmm. to come. This one is specifically let's define God correctly. The Nicodemus one is, is, is very nice. They're all key questions, aren't they? Right. Not exactly word for word, but. This, this Shema, though, is not spoken of in church circles. That's amazing to me. 
it's sort of coming as you get older things move from being a Bible verse you know just a Bible verse to life I find this absolutely captivating I've listened to people talk about this for hours I find this totally fascinating what's the greatest thing to think I mustn't miss listen as a command listen Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and you're to love that Lord with all your heart then your soul in the New Testament as mind, the intellectual part is very important, your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. That's very clear. And your neighbor as yourself. And then we next week we we'll go on with this. Well, who's my neighbor, right? Good question. Even the pagan Samaritan is your neighbor. That's shocking. Jesus had spoken to a Samaritan in John 4. A Samaritan lady outside the realm of Israel. It's amazing. And she comes out to him, has a conversation with him. He's not supposed to talk to those people. They were unclean. The one thing you don't talk to is a Samaritan because they'll get you contaminated quickly, so you don't do that. Here Jesus is not talking to a woman of all things and a Samaritan woman. It's a double whammy. And they're having a conversation. Guess what? She says, this is in John 4, 26, she says, you know, we heard that the Messiah is coming. They did. The Samaritans believed in the Messiah, the one who's going to return, actually. We've heard about this Messiah coming. And Jesus looks her in the eye and says, I am he, meaning I'm the Messiah, right? I'm he, comma, the one speaking with you. Isn't that dramatic? She rushes off and says, hey, come out here. This guy knows that I've been married several times. He's claiming to be the Messiah. That is brilliant. It's a Samaritan. Jesus then is talking to a woman and a Samaritan, breaking the rules, if you like, like the lady who won the argument against him, right? So the Samaritan is the, the evil guy, you're not supposed to, it's a sort of a racist thing, right? You're not supposed to talk to Samaritans. Well, your neighbor includes your Samar Samaritan friends. That's marvelous. So the whole thing is one package. All commands, right? Listen is a command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all, all the strength and the might. So clearly, at this time of year, you see an awful lot of pleasure seeking. We'll, we'll get there. Um, lovers of pleasure are the lovers of God, right? There's an awful lot of stuff going on, which is exciting. Intensely, the question is it advancing the cause towards immortality? Not always, I think. So that's what we need to talk about. Just, just very briefly, before we leave this passage, yes. citizens of heaven. Yes. I know that I've heard people proclaim, I am a citizen of heaven, yes. without understanding. Right. So, can you just uh, give us your analogy of the retirement and the bank? Well, that's right. You put your money in the bank to retire. Store it up. It doesn't mean you go to the bank to retire, does it? Tom Wright has a nice one. Bishop Wright says, I I've left a beer in the fridge for you. It doesn't mean you have to go and drink it in the fridge. You get it. My cousin Rob, John Robinson, J.T. Robinson, rather famous in his day, now deceased, who says, Heaven in the Bible is nowhere the destination of the dying. Whoa, that's enough to get you thrown in prison. That's, that's easy. Everything is the kingdom. It's all about the resurrection. The only way you come back to life is from resurrection, or you survive till Christ comes back. Then you get immortalized. So if anybody's interested in immortality, here's what it is. Okay, time for communion service. Carlos is going to do that for us. We, we do use wine. You know, if that's, if that's not acceptable to anybody, uh, you know, if it is, we, we, can, we can do breakfast too. You know, we, we're making an awesome bridge. Of course, that up. It is, it is. Actually, okay. Well, it's always an honor to lead uh, kings and queens and priests that we are uh, in this, uh, really the only uh, uh, observance in the New Testament, you know, which has went through uh, Christmas and obviously, you know, people observe what, what they understand as the birth of Christ, but Really, this is the, the big one, right? So we do this uh, first Sunday of every month. So I try to bring a focus to the communion service that uh, I, I believe otherwise lacks. Uh, I don't like tradition. That's why I love home church settings so much because I hate pews. I hate pulpits. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interaction as, as our visitors have heard here today. And I think really that's what the early church was all about, you know. There are scriptures that speak to this. Every, anyone has a hymn, anyone has a word, share it, you know. That, that's, I, I think that's, that's pleasing to God. 
like to welcome our visitors. Thanks for coming, Michelle. We haven't seen you in a while. It's good to see you. We know that you're going through very uh, tough times with Tom and hope he's feeling better. Okay, so I was reading, as I always do, uh, about the communion service. And I was reading a uh, Catholic uh, priest, funny enough, you know, they have good things to say. Um. Uh, this guy lived in the seventh century. His name was St. Maximus the Confessor. He said, the things of the Old Testament are the shadow. Those of the New Testament are an image. And truth is the state of the future things to come. Mm -hmm. I think that's very true. Um, so in this new year, and Happy New Year to everyone. Hope everyone's safe and had a good new year. It's important to emphasize this future uh, Christian hope. So we're all, we're all about the gospel of the kingdom. That's the Christian hope. And we're all about uh, one God, the Father, and the human Jesus, Messiah. So with this in mind, I think the communion service today, I'd like to focus on this part, uh, the kingdom, the hope. Uh, a lot of our people, and I just got this email from this uh, fellow, like-minded Christian, he's going through some very tough times. Uh, I think the holidays, as good as they are for, you know, we get time off work and so on, but for a lot of people it's very hard, especially if they're going through trials, so I'm thinking about him and his family. But I'd like to, if he's listening or if he watches this, tell him that we're praying for him and there is a hope. We are going through tough times and the communion service offers us that hope. There's an interesting double meaning of communion and the hope in the Lord's Prayer itself. We touched on the Lord's Prayer. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth. Give us bread today for the coming day. Some people interpret this as the bread of the communion service that Jesus is speaking of here. And that's in Luke 11 and Matthew 6. And then Luke explicitly, obviously, shows this, uh, the service as inextricably bound up with the kingdom hope. Where he says, Jesus, I have been earnestly looking forward to eating this Passover meal with you before my sufferings. And then he says that he will not eat it again until the coming kingdom. In verse 16 so that's Luke 22 16 mm -hmm. and they talks about the cup and they talks about the fruit of the vine that he will not drink of until he says the kingdom of God comes and it's interesting that post resurrection in the book of Acts Jesus did have a meal remember he did sit down and have a meal with them but obviously that wasn't this meal that he will part we will share with him in the kingdom uh, Paul adds a reference to the uh, to actually the second coming and the second coming equals the hope right the second coming is the Christian hope mm -hmm. and Paul mentions that in 1st Corinthians 11 uh, as well uh, this hope there's a good book called the Eucharist in the uh, New Testament by C Codel K-O-D-E-L uh, and it says in part, uh, Paul the Apostle urges a deeper awareness of the meaning of the new covenant shared in the Lord's Supper and thus an authentic proclamation of the Lord's death until he comes in glory. So I think this notion, this orthodox notion of going to heaven when we die and so on takes a lot away from, from this hope I think. So. So as a result, the kingdom promise is center stage in the communion service, as it should be. It shouldn't just be about, you know, other things. Uh, of course, the death and resurrection, the suffering of Messiah is important, but in that horrible uh, situation is the hope that we will one day all have a huge banquet, which a lot of wine and a lot of food and uh, partake with the Lord, imagine that with the Lord Jesus, Paul the Apostle, Abraham, I mean it's going to be incredible. So as we uh, pass the, the bread, and uh, if we can go to 1 Corinthians 
11 as he has the break, please. And I'd like for us to, to read as, as a group the words here of, of the Lord Jesus, starting at verse 23. Uh, Michelle, you want to? <clears throat> Can we do one verse or do the one? Uh, the bread part, please. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we'll take the bread. As we remember the Lord, can now uh, Vicky read the next part about the wine, please? In 1 Corinthians 11 20. Is that 5? Yeah. Thank you. 1 Corinthians 11 25. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant ratified in my blood. Remember me as you drink it. So as we pass the cup. Verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, that's the uh, coming. And we'll take the... Uh, we'll take the wine as we await another year that goes by for the Lord's coming. There's a document that dates from the first century called the Teaching of the Twelve, or the Didache. And it says in part, even as this broken bread was scattered over the hills and was gathered together and became one, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. And uh, we we'll just close with prayer, Barbara. Could you the prayer for the coming. Father in heaven, thank you so very, very much for the opportunity to take communion together and to remember the blessed hope that we have, the kingdom to come, and also for us to focus on what Jesus, our elder brother in the faith, has done for us. And the fact that he continues to be the head of the church. Help us to remember this and to, to in fact, do as we should as apostles, as disciples rather, to preach and to preach the kingdom to others, to, uh, to effectively evangelize and give hope to our fellow men. We thank you. Amen. And I'll just uh, leave you with this uh, verse in Hebrews 10 25, especially for the people, like I said, who did not have a good holiday or are not having one. Continue to keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. And let us not stay away from church meetings. Some people are doing this more and more. Take this opportunity to comfort, encourage, and warn each other, especially as we see the big day approaching. That's how we say it, paraphrase. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're going to sing a song. Yeah. Uh, we have a story to tell the nation. Is that okay, or do you have any requests? <laughs> okay. Anything? Michelle has made some of this music with Jerry possible for us.